ไป I Andrew Kofi e j a p a m e s a Swear by Almighty God. Swear by Almighty God. That the evidence I shall give before this committee. That the evidence I shall give before this committee. Touching the matter in issue. Touching the matter in issue. Shall be the truth. Shall be the truth. The whole truth. The whole truth. And nothing but the truth. And nothing but the truth. So help me God. So help me God. Can I sit? sit. Honorable Andrew Kofi e j a p a m e s a Yes, Mr. Chairman. You are a second term member of this parliament. That is so, Mr. Chairman. You are a lawyer of some 19 years standing, I guess. Is that right? Chairman, I believe I'm uh, 17 years. 17 years standing. That is so. Well, you've worked in the private sector mostly before you were uh, uh, enrolled as a member of parliament. That is so, Mr. Chairman. I started off work with Meshes, a k w a s a m s o n and Associates, a private law firm based in Accra. Uh, subsequently, proceeded to work with First Atlantic Merchant Bank for some seven years, between 2007 and 2013, uh, before Very I set. Well. Uh, uh, the mention of a k w a s a m s o n will influence me. I must a s s u r e Mr. I know that. <laughs> <laughs> Very well. In Parliament, you are a member of the Committee on Privileges, Special Budget, and Constitution and Parliamentary Affairs. Is that right? That is so, Mr. Chairman. That uh, my committee is for the Eighth Parliament. Very well. Now, if there's anything more we must know before we ask you any questions, please tell us. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I believe that um, my CV spells out quite clearly uh, my background in detail. I want the committee to adopt it. Safe to say that um, I'm married with three children. Uh, started primary school in Takradi, Chapel Hill Preparatory School. Uh, I'm a proud Santa Claus, and I went to Adesado. Did my O and A levels uh, before I went to University of Ghana, uh, where I also be belonged to the Commonwealth Hall. Uh, studied political science, and subsequently did another first degree in law. Uh, proceeded to Ghana School of Law. I was called to the bar in 2004. Chairman, it would interest to know that I have two of my mates on your committee as well. Uh, I will make sure they do not ask you questions. Very well, I'm grateful, Mr. Chairman. They will not participate in your vetting, uh, even though they have not disclosed their interest. I I know, so I will not permit them to ask you questions. But Chairman, then again, my professional background, um, work experience, started off in private practice, and proceeded to the bank. Uh, did some seven years at First Atlantic, like I indicated. Started off as assistant manager and ended up as acting head of legal division of the bank. In 2013, I left and set up a small law firm that I've been running since here in Accra. That, yes, that I noticed that on page three of your CV, you say that 2013 to present, lead attorney and CEO. Do you have your certificate? Of Mr. Speaker, permitting you to engage in office of profit, Mr. Chairman, I do not have it here presently with me, but I indeed attended a committee of members holding office of profit, uh, was assessed, and was duly issued with a certificate by the Speaker to practice law. That is why I have it on my CV as being the lead attorney stroke. Chief Executive of m e s c The certificate we issued in 2013 expired in January. Uh, sorry, in 2017, or was expired in, expired in January 2021. Do you have a new one, Mr. Chairman? I don't have a new one uh, because I'm sure uh, you'll be aware that that committee, even though has been set up, has not uh, held any formal 
meetings to make assessments of members who so desire. But in any event, Speaker, my present nomination, if duly approved, will require me to resign entirely from Mesa and Co. and all the activities that I, I did there over the past four years. Very well. Yes, yes. Chairman, I, I usually don't do this. Did I hear you say the Committee on Profit Holding has not started its deliberation? Not to my knowledge, Mr. Chairman. I know a member, so yours is to apply. Have you applied? Mr. Chairman, I have not. Like uh -huh. I said, um, because I have applied, they are working. Others have already met them. They've scheduled, they've cleared others already. So if you have not applied, just say you haven't applied, but don't say they, they've not started working. Very well. Mr. Chairman, I stand corrected. And uh, like I said, uh, since the indication of my nomination by His Excellency the President, uh, it became clear to me that I cannot continue in the role that I occupy at Mesa and Co. So it is my intention, if approved, to resign accordingly. Now, Mr. Chairman, my worry is that the past six months or five months, you've been working there and you've also are a member of parliament. So the two are not related. Whether you become a minister or not has nothing to do with you being a member of parliament and working in that chambers. Mr. Chairman, my, my response would be that obviously if His Excellency the President had not nominated me, I would still be desirous of working there and would have duly put in the application. But like I said, since the indication of my nomination came, uh, I knew quite clearly that my continued stay there would be untenable. And so it is my intention to resign. Uh, indeed, my resignation letters are ready. Uh, if you approve me, uh, I would do Maybe need just, them just to ask whether since January you've not been working in your office. Mr. Chairman, uh, informally, I, I would not sit here and say I do not go to the office. I do go there, uh, except that um, like I said, uh, you and I know the committees itself were constituted not too long ago before we went on recess, and at which point my nomination had been communicated to Mr. Speaker and the good people of this country. Anyway. Yes, the leader. The chairman, I should thank you and uh, join you in congratulating uh, our colleague. In your CV, you undertook a steady visit to the Kenyan National Assembly. Is that right? That is so, Mr. Chairman. What did you learn from there which can improve the parliamentary practice and procedure of the Parliament of Ghana? Thank you, Chair. Mr. Chairman, one thing that was striking was the clear powers that their privileges committee had as opposed to what we do have here. And so clearly that learning, of course, the uh, functions of the Kenyan parliament, the uh, benefits uh, that attaches to that office, the uh, powers that they have in terms of their contribution to national development. They have offices in their constituencies that uh, is fully funded by the state that gives them the ability to influence development in their constituencies directly, as opposed to ours where everything that government does necessarily is through the Judicial Assembly. And so there was a clear distinction between our parliament and the Kenyan parliament. And of course, when we went, uh, we were directly, as members of the Privileges Committee of Ghana's parliament, engaged with that of Kenya. And one striking thing, like I said, was the powers of the committee that was different from what it is that we have here. Chairman, thank you. Eh? Coming back uh, home to the ministry for which you've been nominated to assist the minister as a deputy minister, are you familiar with the Petroleum Revenue Management Act? Mr. Chairman, I have procured a copy of it for myself and uh, still studying it. Chairman, Ghana is rated on the basis of best practice we learn from Norway, from Nigeria, to improve the governance of our petroleum revenue. You have the annual budget funding amount, you have the heritage fund, you have the stabilization fund. Haven't followed the operation of the law. Which aspects of it would you want to see reviewed and to achieve what with it? Thank you, Chair. 
Shema, I believe that when my minister attended upon the committee, uh, this question came up. And he was quite clear that the transparency issues that PIAC has raised would be clearly areas that he would love to see some improvements thereof. And so if uh, you are gracious enough to approve me, uh, I would assist my minister in ensuring that the vision that he has, which obviously is that of His Excellency the President, is carried through to improve our regime respect to our petroleum revenue. Chairman, to the nominee, knowing that our petroleum resources are not infinite and we keep uh, selling oil blocks, do you share the view that we should auction our oil blocks just as we do to opportunities within the telecom sector so that you allow uh, another transparent process of determining who gets what? You do share the view. Thank you, Chair. Mr. Chairman, I believe so that uh, a multiplicity of uh, options with respect to how we uh, deal with our oil resources would be the way to go. Uh, so to that extent, yes. Safe to add that obviously because of the energy transition that is staring us in the face where globally we are all moving towards a carbon neutral uh, uh, economy, uh, energy uses, clean energy, it may be useful if those options that uh, the Honorable Minority Leader just articulated were expeditiously implemented, then we can explore our natural resources as quickly as possible so we get the benefit of same. Thank you. Chairman, I'm just trying to tease out what the nominee is thinking is. In Ghana, you have lifeline consumers, those who just buy electricity for their daily use. And you have industry that also has use of uh, electricity I've heard from organized labor, the TUC and others, but more importantly from the AGI, the Association of Ghana Industry, that we need to restructure the pricing formula as to industry paying less compared to other consumers. Where do you stand on this? Mr. Chairman, I stand with industry. And indeed, my minister has indicated uh, quite clearly the need for a review of the tariff mechanism because we have a situation in, in Ghana where uh, the tariffs are segmented in bands so that uh, the first band pricing is different from the second band and uh, uh, etc. So, uh, and of course, uh, because industry consumes more, then they tend to be in the higher bands that then requires them to pay more tariffs. So if the bonds are taken out and the tariffs is made neutral, for instance, just like you go to the fuel station and buy one gallon of petrol, uh, it costs you X amount, you buy 100 gallons, it costs you X amount times 100. That regime, when applied within the uh, tariff uh, in the el electricity space, will then make it affordable for industry to uh, drive uh, uh, employment and uh, economic growth. Chairman, the energy sector, there is petroleum, there is power. Metering, metering of uh, our oil production blocks. Government has uh, given out a number of these blocks to, uh, for purposes of foreign direct uh, investment to persons who are in the business. Now they come back and just tell the government of Ghana that we we'll produce this number of barrels. We don't have an opportunity to cross-check, to determine whether what they are saying is what it is on the ground as they explore and uh, engage in uh, production. You want to share with this committee what your ideas are in order to safeguard the interests of the state of Ghana and to ensure that we get value for money in the contracts that we've awarded by introducing some kind of metering technology to be able to do that. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chairman. Chairman, I have seen quite recently a video of Saudi Arabia and how they monitor their oil blocks and the quantity of oil that is produced at any point in time. Uh, they have real-time monitoring of they are petroleum assets. Uh, this obviously is a technology now that there's a lot of internet of things. 
that we can deploy in our um, oil blocks to ensure that we have real-time access to the production that takes place there. And so that is something that I believe we should explore quite strongly. Thank you. Uh, Chairman, even though I was ending, I don't know if you took it up, I just walked in. Uh, in your CV, uh, I see Andrew Kofi, uh, Japan Mesa, uh, Patrick will say Messi. Uh, are you the same person? Because the present letter of 21st April 2021 has no Kofi in it. Mr. Chairman, indeed, I'm the same person. Uh, Chairman, it will interest you to know that I was actually christened Saint Andrew Kofi Ejapaya now Which Boniface of the Mesa. Saints? Uh, saint I, I was actually Catholic named after a church. Church or Assembly uh, of God Church? No, the Anglican Church in Second Year. So come back to our question. So which, which name uh, should we? Mr. Chairman, the Andrew Kofi Ejapaya Mesa is the official name that I have on record in Parliament. Yes, and of members. You are one of the classmates, aren't you? <laughs> you are one of the classmates. <laughs> yes, very well, honorable uh, uh, council best. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. of conflict of interest, I declare my interest that uh, honorable Mesa was actually my study mate. Mm. Yes. We are not only classmates, but we're also study mates. Mm. Yes. And uh, I have no doubt that he has capabilities to do this work, but he must speak to one issue. In 1989, the National Electrification Program estimated that by 2022, there will be 100% electricity coverage in Ghana. But the World Bank did a survey in 1999 and said it was 83.5%. How are you going to ensure, assisting your minister, that Ghana gets 100% coverage? Don't say America doesn't have it, because Canada has it. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I I indeed, uh, universal access to electricity is actually defined at about 90% of total population. But you recall that His Excellency the President during the State of the Nation address, which was delivered sometime in February to Parliament, indicated that his desire would be for us to attain 100% by 2024. Uh, as we speak, we are somewhere in the region of 86%. And so clearly a 14% of the mark would not be uh, too onerous to achieve. Uh, I know that where we are now, uh, most of the communities that have not been connected are as a result of their uh, proximity issues to the national grid. Thankfully, there are other options of grid technology, solar, uh, standalone units that can be deployed. Uh, I know that His Excellency the President, in the budget that was presented, indicated that that options were going to be deployed. And so I would assist my minister to ensure that all the technologies that are available to ensure our brothers who are in the 40% bracket get access to electricity in fulfillment of his, his excellence their present vision. Thank you. On behalf of our in 2004, I have instructions to tell you that you have to stick to the rules. In Akotojan 2004, we don't become NDC or MPP ministers. We become ministers for Ghana. So go there and make their group proud. Thank you. I'm grateful. Thank you. Another classmate. Yes, yeah, there's no way about. Thank you very much. Uh, Chairman, let me congratulate my brother, Kofi Ejapa Mesa. Um, I have three questions for you. Uh, the current crude market prices, um, Brent is trading at seven to one point two four dollars. Um, WTI crude, that's about sixty nine, almost seventy. 
natural gas is around $3.10. And we are still struggling with the ENI Springfield unitization program uh, process. We've read a lot. The minister has stated government's position to ensure that this process is completed. Um, can you tell the country what the real issues are and what you'll be doing to assist your minister to ensure that we derive the optimum benefit from this unitization process in view of the fact that in the 2021 budget, we estimated um, a barrel of crude, I think, around $50 in the 2021 budget so that we can get an optimum benefit from this agreement. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I believe that uh, the Springfield ENI issue is a pretty straightforward one. Uh, our law is clear on what would warrant uh, unitization of two adjoining blocks. Uh, it's to the effect that when there's some accumulation that straddles uh, two contractual areas, in order for us to derive economies of scale, uh, we ought to unitize so that only one operator can explore the resource. Uh, I believe that that's what informed the directive that was issued by the uh, former Minister for Energy, John Peter Mewu, uh, to Springfield uh, and uh, uh, ENI to unitize because the Afina and the Sankofa blocks uh, tend to straddle and there's accumulation that uh, 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 straddles both, both fields. Uh, my understanding, and I do not know the full details, is that the directives that were issued had with that some percentage of track participation in the field that inured to the benefit of Springfield as opposed to ENI. That has led to ENI objecting to that uh, directive that the minister issued. But like I said, it's a pretty straightforward matter. Uh, issue of unitization uh, is not in doubt. Uh, and so I believe that uh, some third party assessment ought to be made to determine whether indeed the percentages that the minister issued, which as a result of some uh, assessment that GMPC had done, would be the way to go. And I believe that we can quickly resolve that issue and uh, uh, unitize the field so that Ghana can get the benefit of producing uh, 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 resources from that field through one operator. Thank you. Uh, Chairman, um, the second question is on um, PDS. Your, the famous informal newspaper has had your name on its front and pictures on its front pages, connecting you the PDS transaction. I, I never knew your role. I didn't know you were a minister at the time. I, I don't know, but what did you do with respect to that transaction? So you could clear the minds of Ghanaians and all of us who've been seeing your name and your photograph on the front pages any time this, this issue arises. <clears throat> Thank you. Mr. Chairman, uh, to directly answer your question, I did not play any role whatsoever in PDS. I'm not a director of PDS, neither am I a shareholder of PDS. And so uh, it's interesting uh, the kinds of associations that have been made. However, Mr. Chairman, in 2014, I was engaged to incorporate a company for a client of mine who asked me to be director secretary, uh, which is pretty much usual with law practitioners. It turned out that that company, which is called TG Energy, went into some unincorporated joint venturership, which is usually referred to as some consortium, that then bid for the ECG PSP process 
and ultimately when they won, incorporated a company called PDS that then contracted with the government of Ghana. Mr. Chairman, the corporate law principles are quite clear that a company is separate and distinct from its shareholders. And that indeed PDS, when it was incorporated, has its own directors and secretary. I took the pains to actually do an official search uh, before appearing before your committee. And it's clear who the directors of PDS are and who the shareholders of PDS are. Nowhere is Andrew Ejapa Mesa found in those, these two categories. Uh, but like I said, uh, it was uh, interesting that because the documentation for the transaction had my name as director in one of the shareholders of PDS, then it became easy to associate me with PDS and create an impression as if to say I was connected some way, somehow to PDS. But the truth of the matter is that I'm not a director of PDS, nor am I a shareholder of PDS. Indeed, I'm not even a shareholder of the company that I incorporated for the client. So question of interest in itself, Mr. Chairman, does not arise, has never arisen. Uh, uh, because interest, as opposed to fiduciary, which is what directors are, is quite clear. Interests are transferable. They are either real or incorporeal. They are either tangible or intangible. These are property. It's a legal construct that is transferable. My role as a director in TG Energy cannot, under any circumstances, be described as transferable to until me having an interest in that transaction. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. The last question. Let's go back home to second D, where my old man started life. It's made up of big fishing community. Um, you have some few challenges when it comes to youth unemployment. They love you, and they would want to hear from you what you are going to use your new offices to assist how you are going to use your new offices to assist them uh, get some job opportunities within the area, especially the second D, Takradi area. They want to hear from you, so your constituents. Thank you. Chairman, that's my last question. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Chairman, the issue of job and youth unemployment in second D, like several other constituencies in Ghana, is real. Uh, yes, second is a fishing community. Uh, we have a functional fishing harbor, uh, uh, Albert Bosomchitsan Fishing Harbor, uh, that provides some job opportunities for the youth there. But obviously, it's not enough to meet the uh, aspirations of everybody, particularly the youth who are resident in second day. Uh, in 2016, our manifesto uh, as a party, the New Patriotic Party, uh, anticipated the expansion of the port from Takrade to Sekendi. And obviously, that would be a game changer, uh, an industrial port that was contemplated would obviously be a game changer for Sekendi, particularly having regard to the fact that we have issues with land. Sekendi is a pretty well built up uh, constituency. And so that offers us an opportunity to then see what industry can be situated there. And so if I am, by your kind indulgence, uh, approved, uh, I would use my offices to uh, liaise, as I've always done with the Ministry of Transport. Uh, I'm glad Hassan is here. I hope that he also goes through uh, when he meets this committee uh, to work together to see how quickly we can progress on that to uh, get some jobs into second day for the teaming youth out there. Thank you. Honorable uh, Director, first. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning and congratulations, Honorable Nomni. Good morning, thank you. Mr. Nomni, there's been some agitations recently. I think sometime last week it started by some aggrieved, aggrieved staff of 
separate code. Please, would you be able to apprise this committee on what the issues are and what is causing uh, this situation? Would it be related to the current transmission difficulties that we are facing in this country? Thank you. Mr. Chairman, I'm not aware of uh, agitations by employees of Greco, and so I'm not in a position to speak to that. It was all over the media last week, and uh, I thought that for someone who is built for a position in that particular ministry, you would have been interested or someone would have brought it to your attention. But I set a situation ongoing at Gridco, and it will be important that the Energy Ministry finds out what's going on, steps in, so that we can curtail any other challenges that will further compound the already difficult situation we are having with energy. My second question is about green energy. What would you say is the Ministry's policy position on that, and why are we so slow as a country to embrace green energy. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, uh, I'll be interested uh, in any matter that borders on the sector uh, if I am duly confirmed. But this news on grid co, uh, I probably may have missed it because uh, in, in all and honesty, I'm not aware. So I'll follow up to see what the issues are. And uh, of course, if you confirm me and uh, I have some contribution to make in resolving it, yes, by all means. Uh, with respect to clean energy, um, I don't think that we are necessarily slow. Uh, this is evolving technology. Yes, the advanced countries have had it for a while. They are scaling up their uh, uh, use of that technology. Uh, we have, as a country, because of our international obligations, the Paris Agreement, and joins us to also move from uh, carbon fuel to clean energy. And the ministry, to my understanding, uh, has a policy of having at least 10% of our generation mix being uh, uh, clean energy. And uh, there's a clear plan that has been laid out to ensure that we attain that by 2030. And so I would assist my minister uh, to the best of my ability to ensure that we achieve that 10% of our generation mix being renewable. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And that's my last question. Every day, ordinary Ghanaians are complaining about high electricity tariffs. In fact, uh, most people utilizing electricity for their businesses are beginning to think of other ways of doing it. Others have started using generators, which of course also add to the fuel bill of this country. What will be the ministry's plan to make electricity more affordable to Ghanaians? Thank you. Chairman, I believe that my minister also addressed this matter when he appeared before the committee and indicated quite clearly that because of the technical and generation losses that ECG incurs, which is in the region of some 39%, uh, they do not generate enough revenue to enable them meet their operational expense. And so the easy way out at all times would be to call for increases in electricity tariffs. That obviously impacts the consumer. And so he would lead a charge in bringing efficiency into the operations of ECG so that their technical and operation losses are reduced so that they can then generate more revenue from their operations to fund their cost. That then would lead to the reduction in the need for increases in tariffs that would inure to the benefit of the consumer. And so I would support my minister in that pursuit so that we can bring much needed relief to all of us who are consumers of electricity. Thank you.
Uh, as a follow-up, is, is this initiative going to be backed by an executive policy that would be aimed at ensuring that, indeed, the issues of inefficiencies are dealt with? Because, you see, way back 2013, when ECG appeared before the Finance Committee, uh, the Joint Committees of Finance and Energy, they lamented the same thing. Uh, Ama Kofibwa, you know, was on the same uh, part. Honorable uh, Kwabna Donko expressed the same worry. So this time around, uh, you sure it will be a policy to deal with it or just a ministerial effort? Zeman, I'm not in a position to confirm whether it will be some executive policy or ministerial to the extent that I've not had uh, extensive deliberations on this matter with my minister. And so if uh, you are gracious enough to approve me, uh, I would deliberate with him and get an indication of what his views are and then support him in formulating whatever policy, either ministerial or executive, to ensure that those efficiencies or inefficiencies in the ECG space what are your own views, though? Because from what Honorable Member is saying, and from what we all know, paying high tariffs by consumers, industry, is not, nothing palatable, you and I know. So let us know what your views will be. Chairman, I agree with you. Uh, if you look at what goes into the PURC tariff uh, setting. Uh, clearly, they allow some element of inefficiency. That, I believe, is as a result of the regulations that they operate with, which uh, is legislation. And so I think that further action in terms of executive or ministerial may not be required. It's just the enforcement of that regulation that then leads to the efficiency that is required to ensure that whatever ECG does is consistent with the rules that is already applicable. And so that would be the path that I would go um, uh, in proposing to my minister uh, that strong implementation enforcement of the existing rules. Uh, because, Chairman, oftentimes our uh, easiest solution is to pass some new rule or issue some new directive when, uh, in fact, we have significant uh, uh, rules in place that we just don't enforce. And so uh, multiplicity of rules will not necessarily lead to resolution of the matter, I think that enforcement of this one will be the way to go. Thank you. Yes. Noble Nomini, let me commend you. Um, I'm very much aware you know the, the passage of the Renewable Energy Act. And then we also have a master plan back in the act um, as a country, we've gone ahead to amend the act that established WIPA authority to incorporate the, the usage of renewable energy. Even to that end, we have still not been able to achieve. And I heard your answer to the honorable member when you said that we are not necessarily slow, but I think that we could do better. Uh, the passage of the act, the establishment of the master plan, the amendment of the act that established WIPA authority. We are still not moving at the pace that uh, we are all desirous of. What in your estimation is the real challenge or the core of the challenge? What should we be doing as a nation to be able to up the usage of clean energy? Chairman, I believe that uh, even as of this material time that we have in this conversation, 
ECG has signed several power purchase agreements with solar, wind, wave technology, and all that. But we are confronted with a situation where we have excess capacity on our hands that we are actually paying for power that we do not consume. And so question is, yes, you ought to improve the availability of clean energy. And uh, on the other hand, you have a situation where you have excess capacity. Of course, with increases in industrial activity, with increases in population, uh, I believe that it's estimated that our ECG or power consumption increased about 3% uh, per annum. And so I believe that in the medium 10, 10 years, where we'll be having some additional capacity added on to meet the demands of the time, more focus should be shifted to renewable energy so that we can increase that and then slow down on the fossil fuel dependent generation plants. And I'm sure that if we do that, we would be able to balance uh, uh, our energy mix and achieve the targets that we've set for ourselves as a nation. Thank you. Uh, honorable nominee, um, the Germans are doing a couple of things with us, uh, especially in the area of conversion of waste to energy. And it's largely decentralized. If you go to parts of Asante region, I'm aware of a number of interventions there. I recognize your answer when you mentioned loudly uh, the existence of uh, excess capacity and all that. And we also went ahead to acknowledge the importance of clean energy. We, okay, in the wake of environmental challenges that we have, and the fact that we are unable to process our waste, has it crossed your mind the need for us to be able as a nation, look at the tendency to convert waste into energy? Has that crossed your mind? And if it has, what would you be able to do to assess your minister? achieve it? Yes, uh, Mr. Chairman, it has. Uh, but looking through the national energy policy, uh, I did not even find as a policy uh, waste to energy. Uh, what I saw obviously was nuclear, coal, uh, solar, and then the traditional um, uh, fossil fuel dependent transmission, I mean, generation that we have. Uh, I'm told, and indeed last week when the Honorable Reku was here, uh, the same question was posed to him. And he indicated that the cost that is associated with um, waste to energy uh, is pretty much prohibitive. And so that's why we haven't paid too much attention to that uh, generation uh, potential. Uh, obviously, with evolving technology, uh, some of these costs come down. Uh, they tend to reduce. Indeed, a couple of weeks, I saw a newspaper publication uh, where the Zoom Lion group of companies had signed some uh, MOU with an American company to do waste to energy. Uh, obviously, because they manage uh, most of our landfills, uh, they tend to be the dominant player in the waste uh, space. They potentially would have uh, the raw material, which is the waste, to generate the, 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 the power. And so uh, I guess that uh, it's an area that we need to look at. And uh, I can assure you that if you are gracious enough to approve me, uh, I would look at it. Uh, I must quickly add that uh, as I said before you this morning, I do not know which sector that my minister is going to place me. And so if I happen to find myself in the power uh, sector, then of obviously that will be part of my portfolio. Uh, but if I'm not, then uh, I may have to discuss with my colleague who, or whoever ends up there to see how we can uh, broaden our scope and consider those options uh, in our mix as well. Thank you. 
Mr. Chair, this will be my last. Honorable uh, Nobini, um, you, you rarely intimated a policy direction on nuclear and coal. And if you look globally, even the most industrialized countries are gravitating away from coal and nuclear. In your opinion, do you think it is something we have to review as a country vis-a-vis -vis climate change and all the calls by international bodies and all the existing conventions that we have signed on as a country? Do you think we have to move away? Mr. Chairman, on the contrary, uh, particularly with respect to nuclear, uh, I think that that is something that we need to explore uh, because, like you said, we're moving to clean energy and nuclear is a relatively cleaner energy than most other power sources. And so I think that it is something that we need to pursue. Uh, I know that the ministry has made some strides in that regard. Uh, nuclear, nuclear power Ghana has been set up. Uh, they are engaging vendor countries to sign MOUs with and uh, they have identified locations where they are doing some seismic studies to see its suitability. And so I believe strongly that if our uh, industrialization agenda is to pick up, then cleaner energies that are safe, uh, including nuclear, should be explored quite strongly. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Thank you very much, Honorable Chair, for the opportunity. Honorable nominee, Andrew Kofi Ajapa Mesa. Let me put on record that he's one of the colleagues I love to agree to disagree with. Are you also the one of the mates? No, ah. unfortunately. <laughs> <laughs> I just love to agree to disagree with him because um, He's very intellectual and doesn't take issues to heart, no matter how heated the discussion goes. Um, he keeps an open mind, and I think many of us need that. Um, on the subject of PDS, you have answered a couple of questions, but I'd like to revisit that, especially because we um, have to remember how the state lost $190 million of the Millennium Challenge uh, Corporation facility as a result of this botched deal. You, in your answer, indicated that a client requested you to incorporate a company, TG Energy Solution, which eventually became part of PDS that got um, the opportunity to manage a strategic national asset such as the ECG, and later um, got that uh, contract terminated on allegations of fraud. Now, I'm not a lawyer, and like Chairman asked, I wasn't part of your year group, but um, I'd like to know Two things. When clients request lawyers to incorporate companies, do the lawyers serve, or is it permitted for them to be secretaries, directors, and lawyer at the same time? Because the records will show that TG Energy Solutions actually had you as director, lawyer, and secretary and had your office um, address at its business operate, operations center. Uh, is that what um, is done? And in the face of Parliament's approval of PDS, um, given your familiar relationship with TG Energy Solutions, don't you think it's your involvement in Parliament's approval, the seven Parliament's approval, uh, amounted to a conflict of interest. Those are the two things I want to find out on this. I will take the second aspect first. Uh, Mr. Chairman, in the first place, 
you can disclose an interest where one exists. But if you don't have any interest, I fail to see how you can be called upon to declare an interest. Uh, as I've indicated, the transaction that the government of Ghana executed with Power Distribution Service Ghana Limited as a legal entity, separate and distinct from its shareholders, I do not have or did not have any interest in PDS. And so there was no requirement on me to make any disclosures. Mr. Chairman, uh, I think it's important to emphasize Chair, once again. Chair, would you leave? When you say interests, are you saying you are not a shareholder? Is that the point you want to make? That, that is so. And uh, I was going further to explain that interest is a legal construct. It is in the nature of a property. It's transferable. Fiduciary, which is who a director is, is not transferable. It's not property. You are appointed at the pleasure of the owner of the entity, and you are subject to termination without recourse to any relief. That was the relationship that existed between myself and TG Energy. And so the parliamentary approval of a transaction between the government of Ghana and PDS, uh, chairman, would have amounted to being a uh, busybody if I had stood in the chamber to say that, Mr. Chairman or Mr. Speaker, I have an interest. Because I did not. And so I cannot uh, respectfully be accused of having been conflicted when I participated in the approval process in Parliament. Uh, the first question which I will take now, uh, relating to lawyers being requested, uh, uh, and I'm glad you used the word request. If clients request you to carry out a certain function for them, you are at liberty to either accept or decline the request. Uh, it is not unusual for lawyers to act as directors, secretaries to entities that they are engaged to incorporate. And that's what I did. With respect to the business used, business operating, uh, I, if you may. Um, if, 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 if I may, just a quick follow up. Uh, my question was whether that is the appropriate thing that is done. Uh, it may not be unusual, but it may be inappropriate. Uh, the, the, Mr. Chairman, re really, the question of appropriateness does not arise, uh, with all due respect at all, uh, because directorship of companies and company secretarial job uh, is uh, the field of everybody who has competencies that the owner of business desires to call upon to uh, play that role. And, uh, and so to that extent, um, I, I did not see anything wrong with it at all. Uh, question of where they were operating from. It's important, Mr. Chairman, and if you permit me, to draw a clear distinction between registered office and place of business. It's completely different. Registered office is a requirement of law where, uh, and of course, indeed, the place of business is also a requirement. Uh, they can be one and the same, or they can be separate from each other. Typically, lawyers, accounting firms, because of the need for you to have a place where processes can be served on the company. Uh, use lawyers' offices, accountants' firms as registered office, and uh, it's not unusual at all. And so, yes, TG Energy was incorporated with its registered office as the law offices of Mesa and Company. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And if I may add, that was not their place of business. Thank you. Well, um, so 
in my earlier um, preamble, I alluded to the fact that this PDS contract was terminated uh, on grounds of alleged fraud or fraudulent misrepresentation or representation. You were very vocal in the news at the time in defense of PDS stance and disagreed in some cases with the accession of the sector ministers, here being the deputy and the min substantive minister, that PDS did not have or presented a fraudulent demand guarantee. You defended that and you thought the minister misspoke and the deputy minister um, perhaps did not get it right. Now you are being vetted and if approved to go to the same ministry where this transaction has not fully been dealt with yet because as we speak, there is still um, litigation over uh, some accounts that the PDS and ECG managed together. You go into that ministry. Now based on this allegation of fraud by previous ministers, which you disagreed with as far as this transaction is concerned, and if approved, you will be working in that ministry where this transaction is still um, being um, handled. What will be or what should we expect your attitude to be as far as this um, alleged fraud that resulted in the nation losing $190 million of the MCC um, facilities concerned? Mr. Chairman, uh, you are right. I disagreed strongly with the then Minister for Energy for the choice of words in describing the transaction as fraudulent, and I still disagree with him now. Because, Mr. Chairman, I read the statement that was issued by the Minister of Information, the official mouthpiece of the Republic of Ghana, the government of the Republic of Ghana. And in that statement, the Information Minister said that government had detected some material breaches and so had proceeded to suspend the transaction pending investigation. Mr. Chairman, following the investigation that was conducted by the government of Ghana that led to the termination of the transaction, nowhere in the official communication were the words fraud used. Mr. Chairman, indeed, I have read the FTI report which was commissioned by MCC. And the issues were clear. Mr. Chairman, I further proceed to add that I'm a lawyer. And so words like fraud, uh, which connotes grave, uh, if you like, offenses, ought not be used loosely, or if you like, without the requisite fact or evidence to support it. And so with all the information that was available to me at the time, led me to draw the conclusion that the then Minister of Energy had me spoke, and I'm on record to have used those words in disagreement with the minister. And like I said, the basis was the official correspondence that had come from the Ministry of Information which clearly did not suggest fraud at all. Uh, Chairman, uh, you see, there's a lot of misconception out there. And I think that the PDS transaction, the way it ended, was unfortunate. But I do not see fraud anywhere. Because here is an entity that had, as part of its contractual obligations, procured an insurance guarantee through Danwell Insurance from a company that is based in uh, the Middle East, Akut. Akut issued the 
guarantee the finance or transaction advisors, the lawyers on the transaction, indeed approved of the text of the guarantee. And they submitted it in satisfaction of the obligations under the contract. Subsequently, some inquiry was made by the board chairman of ECG soliciting some documents from Alkut. And our court then comes and says that the official within our organization that signed the guarantee did not have requisite authority. They did not deny the existence of the guarantee or the fact that it was issued by the company. Nowhere did they deny that. But they said that the official did not have appropriate authority to sign that guarantee, and so they were not going to be held liable under that. Based on this representation from al -Qut, the government of Ghana says, hold on a minute. If the guarantee that you procured and submitted to us. Chairman, by way of, of follow-up, just, yeah, sure. You, you see, uh, honorable nominee, a lawyer speaking law, and uh, a non-lawyer, using his choice of words. So I just want us to take away the technicalities. I can understand that your disagreement was based on the choice of words, that technically or by law, uh, using these words or the physiology that was introduced by the minister was what you disagreed with. Correct. I mean, I just want us to be on the same path. Correct. Absolutely. Correct. Mr. Chairman. So that 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 being said, the view taken by government, therefore, was that the guarantee that had been issued by Akut, which guarantee its principles denying thereof upon enhanced due diligence by ECG. That matter having come to the attention of government, government was therefore to protect the public purse and terminated or took steps to resolve or whatever, correct? Mr. Chairman, you've hit the deal right on the head. That, what I'm saying is that that you do not disagree. That's the point. Not at all. I yes, do not sure. So our colleague actually wants you to position the, the, the matter well, that you are going to the ministry. You are going to the Ministry of Energy. His, his understanding of that disagreement in terms of choice of words is to the effect that you disagree with the termination and you disagree with the position taken by the ministry. I, that is, so limit yourself within that scope. And let us understand you as members of this committee. Else it's as if Indeed, you were in disagreement with government, and his worry is that you are going to the ministry. Is it the case that having had that disagreement, and you saying you maintain the same position, you are going into such a situation? So clarify that it was just a matter of law and use of words, and the substance, you had no problem with it, if it is the case. That is all. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Indeed, that, that was what I was coming to. Mr. Uh, Chairman, I think, I think uh, since, since I'm here, let me, let me clarify that. Let me clarify and state what I actually wanted. Uh, listening, lis listening, no, please, please. Listening to the narration, listening to the narration until the, um, okay, I won't use the word interruption, the, the guidance, came, the intervention came from the deputy majority leader. I get the notion that if your narration is to be believed, it would then mean that some injury and loss may have been caused to PDS in this whole transaction, for which if you become deputy minister of state, and they make claims on government, your advice to your minister will be that they were wrongly treated. Not at all, Mr. Chairman. Uh, the position that the government of Ghana took is founded in law 
and I support the position that the government of Ghana took by terminating the agreement. Because as of completion date, the guarantee that PDS submitted was found to be worthless. The completion date being the date that the asset was transferred, the obligation was to provide a valid guarantee as of that date. Post that date, I'll could result from that obligation under the guarantee. So effectively, Mr. Chairman, that guarantee was not in place. And so government was right to terminate the agreement. And I stand squarely with the government of Ghana for that decision. Thank you. Well, Mr. Chairman, material breaches, uh, worthless uh, demand guarantee, all sound like what they say about diplomatic language, saying the nastiest thing in the nicest way. So instead of call it fraud, you call it material breaches, you call it um, worthless uh, demand guarantee. That's just by the way. But let me take you to your constituency. Um, yesterday, the Premier League saw a very exciting match. I recall when I was a fanatic of Real Tamale United, RTU. I am still a supporter, but no longer a fanatic. <laughs> when I was a fanatic of Real Tamale United, one of the teams that used to be in the rivalry brackets of um, Asante Kotoko Hearts Olympics RTU was Hazakes. Um, what has been your support to that um, club? And what do you say to some controversy over whether they requested jerseys from you or not? And did you give them those jerseys? Mr. Chairman, my support to Hazakes, to be honest, is very minimal. Uh, because I'm a supporter of Second Eleven Wise. And, 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 and so my support to secondary level wise is well documented. I have provided some support to Hazakas in the past, but like I said, it's very minimal because both teams are suffering, both wise and Hazakas. And so naturally, uh, because my affinity to wise uh, is quite well known, I tend to uh, lend the literary resource that I have more to Weiss than to Hazakes. I do not recall a request for Jesse in the past, but if a request for a Jesse had come, I'm sure that that wouldn't have been too much to do for them. And if the need still exists, uh, you can rest assured that uh, I will take steps to uh, meet that need. But like I said, I do not recall that such request came to me in the past. Thank you. Now, finally, Mr. Chairman, to... Um the sector that you are going to, and I take note of um, your uh, statement earlier that you yet do not know which part of the ministry, which sector of the ministry you'll be in charge of. But the, is this issue of NPA and its relationship with uh, the OMCs and the BDCs, um, especially with the chambers or chamber that represent these groups and what interest the chamber serves. NPA, um, their um, members or the consumer. Um, this has led to even some OMCs and BDCs attempting to break away from their chambers lately. Um, what, if you have followed, do you make of um, the relationship and how can it better be enhanced to serve members of these associations and especially the consumer? Mr. Chairman, I'm not so clear as uh, uh, the nature of the question because uh, I would have thought that uh, chambers, which are associations of private uh, business people who then form such chambers to be 
the advocates in terms of some policy direction on their behalf uh, would not in itself be of interest to the NPA, which is a regulator that then ensures that quality uh, availability of the products that the downstream operators uh, deal in uh, is done at, if you like, arm's length basis. Uh, but uh, Mr. Chairman, rest assured that if there are issues that will create some instability uh, that will lead to the unavailability of the product uh, to the consumer, then it would be of interest to the ministry. And I can assure you that I will look into it uh, in the event that I end up in that sector to ensure that uh, whatever issues that they are resolved. Thank you. I, I do wish you well. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, my good friend. Yes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Good morning to... Good morning, Honorable Nomi. Good morning. Exactly midday. Um, I have a... Based on your legal background, and... Um, this is a question that I'm sure a lot of customers of ECG want to know. For those whose gadgets get damaged because of power fluctuations, what legal advice will you give them, <laughs> typically? You have to pay. No, he, he's, he's in the seat. He can answer. I don't know, but I think it's unfair to ask him to advise his, <laughs> his opponents. So, are they opponents? So, you know, his customers, how to... Uh, take legal action against him. Well, that's, that's, that's where he's going. I kindly ask another question, please. Oh, Mr. Chairman, he was touted as saying that it's because of his legal background that uh, uh, the president nominated him for this position. So I think he's the best person to... To defend... To defend, to, to you know... To defend if customers sue him. Or not to advise customers how to sue him. <laughs> so at this point, customers don't know what action to take. Okay. Based, based on, again, your legal background, what advice did you give as a company secretary during the PDS Bruhaha? That caused the government a lot of embarrassment and also the compact. Again, I'm referring it to your saying that it is because of your legal background that the president has taken, has nominated you. Um, you understand my question? Yes, Mr. Chairman, I do. Uh, my simple response to the question is that I was not secretary to PDS. In fact, the company secretary on record for PDS at the company's registry Chairman, if you permit me, I believe it's Minka Premo and uh, Associates. And, and so, Chairman, yes, Mr. Minka Premo and company are the listed company secretaries to PDS. So if they had any issues with the law, uh, I don't know whether they were external solicitors as well because it could be uh, a role that potentially may be played by two different entities. And so I wouldn't know what advice that they received. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Then maybe I should have directed it to TG Energy rather, since you are company secretary for that one. Chairman, TG Energy had no contract or engagement with the government of Ghana. So my advice was not sought with respect to the transaction on the reference. Thank you. I find that hard to believe, but we'll take it as you, as you say. Um, two weeks ago, the deputy minority leader warned against deputy minister designates who were partaking in official duties. What have you done 
since you were nominated. And for to warrant such a warning across board, just give us an idea. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, I've had the benefit of visiting the minister on a number of occasions, but I've not asked the Constitution in Article 80, I believe, says that I have not entered upon the duties of my office uh, without subscribing to the oaths that are listed thereon. So uh, to answer directly, I have not performed any official duty since my name was mentioned by His Excellency the President. Thank you. That will be all, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Yeah, leader. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I would just want to start with um, the importation of uh, Finnish petroleum products. It is estimated that about 95% of all the Finnish products that we are using are imported. Are you aware of this? Mr. Chairman, I believe so. So it's a tall, really, uh, which is the only refinery that we have, is not uh, functioning optimally. Do you know why TOR is not functioning? Mr. Chairman, I wouldn't know the details, but my understanding is that they have some huge financial constraints and some uh, plant uh, uh, got damaged, I believe, sometime in 2017. And uh, the insurance claim that they made to replace couldn't get them because they made some modifications to the existing plant. And so the funding was inadequate to uh, replace what had been damaged. Thank you. And you think the, this large importation auger was for our petroleum industry? Mr. Chairman, as a country, I believe that if we are able to refine our uh, petroleum products here and consume them, uh, obviously, uh, be much more beneficial. Thank you. So in your view, I mean, as a business person and going to that ministry, what advice will you give to the minister to see to the revitalization of uh, TOR? Mr. Chairman, I believe that that ought to be a priority. And my understanding is that my minister is working assiduously in that regard to revive the fortunes of Tor, and I will support him in that enterprise. Thank you. In your earlier answer to a question, you were talking about excess capacity, right? That is so, Mr. Chairman. And you alluded to the fact that we have a lot of uh, plants that we are not using and we are paying money on. Yes. So what would you say are the current challenges that have led to distribution shortages that all of us are feeling the pain whilst we have excess capacity? Mr. Chairman, I believe that uh, about three weeks ago, the minister held a press briefing and apprised the good people of this country about the challenges that we're having in our transmission space, that it's seen some work, uh, Pukwasi, bulk supply point is a case in point. The Kaswa bulk supply point is also another one. And of course, the instability within the central belt, uh, Ashanti region and Kumasi and its environs as a result of the reduction in the water level at uh, Bui. Uh, of course, because of the transmission work that is ongoing and because of the obsolete nature of the existing transmission infrastructure, many of the power that is produced essentially in the west and the east, that is Tema and Takrade, is not being, uh, there's no capacity to carry it to complement 
what is happening in the central belt. And so that's the reason why we are having the instability in the central belt and also the programmed outages that we experienced in Accra as a result of the Pukwase and uh, 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 Kaswa uh, bulk supply point projects that are being carried out. So I just want to find out from him. I know he hasn't been there. Whether he has cross-checked these facts and he's abreast with the facts as they pertain on the ground. Or he's just relying on what the minister's press conference said. Yes, Mr. Chairman, I'm relying on what the minister indicated in his press briefing. Thank you. But have you, because you are preparing to come here, have you cross-checked whether this SS so-called SS capacity are uh, SS that is available. Mr. Chairman, um, yes, uh, indeed, the fact of the matter is that our total peak demand, uh, I think it was in February of 2021 that we experienced about 3,100 megawatts of power. Our installed capacity is in excess of 5,000, and our dependable capacity is in the region of some 4,900. So obviously, if your peak demand is 3,100 and your installed and dependable capacity is 4,900, 5,200, then the gap between the peak demand and the dependable capacity, even if you are taking a conservative position, would be excess. And so that I know as a matter of fact. Thank you. Yeah, so you know that just as you yourself try to clarify the installed and dependable as against available are three different things, right? Mr. Chairman, I believe that dependable and available are the same. It's just the install that is the uh, differentiator between those three terms. Thank you. Are we? Are you aware whether we are exporting power to any of our neighboring countries? Mr. Chairman, no. Mr. Chairman, I just want to take him back to PDS. TG Energy Solutions Ghana Limited. What was their interest, the nature of their interest in the PDS? Mr. Chairman, they are listed as a shareholder of PDS. So indirectly, they were more or less part of the owners of PDS, right? Yes, Mr. Chairman. And you were a director and a secretary to TG Energy Solutions Ghana Limited, am I right? You are correct, Mr. Chairman. What was the nature of your interest in TG Energy Solutions Ghana Limited? Mr. Chairman, I had no interest whatsoever. Thank you. If you are, but when you say you had no interest, you are employed by the company, so to speak. Is that not an interest? Not, not at all, Mr. Chairman. Like I explained, my understanding of interest is in the nature of property. And so. But if you're paid, it's property, isn't it? And as remuneration for services rendered, I'm not sure that would be property in the nature of an interest. That's my understanding. I stand, I stand to be corrected. Do you, Very do, well. you, do, you, do you have interest in Parliament? Mr. Chairman, I'm an elected member of the Good People of Second D. Um, I will ask him, do you have interest in Parliament? I don't think that I have an interest in Parliament. So whether Parliament yes. collapses or Parliament is overthrown, it doesn't matter to you. 
Mr. Chairman, for purposes of protecting our democracy, I would be interested in Parliament uh, existing and continuing the functions that it plays, which I believe is pretty so important. So you if you are a director and a secretary to a company, how do you say that you are not, you don't have interest? I, I chose my words carefully. I didn't say, I didn't ask whether you are a shareholder. I asked, what is the nature of your interest in TG Energy Solutions Ghana Limited? Mr. Chairman, as I explained, my understanding of interest, which is really a legal construct, is one that is in the nature of a property that is transferable, either tangible or intangible, uh, real. But with respect to my duty or my relationship with TG Energy, Mr. Chairman, my understanding is that it's in the nature of a fiduciary, uh, which is separate from an interest. And so that's why I so, Mr. Chairman, I'll just ask you, do, not have do, you, draw, do you draw benefits from TG Energy Solutions Ghana Limited? I should have been, but I never did. Uh, because the contractual relationship required that I be paid, but I was never paid. And you allow them to use your business premises as their business premise? Mr. Chairman, TG Energy did not operate from Mesa and Co. Mesa and Co. was the registered office of TG Energy. Mr. Chairman, as I explained earlier, registered offices for purposes of the Companies Act is a location where a company is supposed to provide for purposes of service of process and other official documents on them. Uh, place of doing business, which is where they operate from on a day-to-day -day basis, is different. And like I said earlier, TG Energy did not operate on a day-to-day -day basis from Mesa and Co. Thank you. And where they were operating, the place of uh, the business operation didn't have an address. Mr. Chairman, I'm not aware of the place of business that they were carrying out. I'm sure that it will be in their incorporation documents. No, because in their cooperation document, it is indicated that the very address that you, your business location was their address. And you are telling us that yes, they had a different place of operation from where they indicated as their business address, which is your address. And that address was purposely for serving them and letters and what have you, but they were operating in a different place. And I ask you, so are you saying that where they were operating didn't have an address? Shaman, I would believe that it would. And what prevented them from using that, but chose to use your address as their address? Mr. Chairman, at the time of incorporation, they obviously didn't have any business. And like I said, registered office, being lawyer's office, accountant office, is pretty common. But and since so they started, since they started doing business that you knew they've now had business, why didn't you take steps to get them to change their address to their business location instead of your place? Mr. Chairman, uh, the need did not arise. Well, so you see the the struggle about conflict of interest. You are saying that the need didn't arise. This, were, this is a company that you are a director, you are a secretary, and obviously 
you do everything to protect their interests because you are a director. If you not accept to protect their interests, you not accept to be a director there. Your company is providing secretaryship to that company. And that company has shares in PDS. And PDS is discussed in parliament. And you didn't see the need to recuse yourself in a manner that will not endanger or will avoid a conflict of interest. And you don't see anything wrong with that. Mr. Chairman, without sounding repetitive, the clear distinction between the entity that the government of Ghana contracted with, which is PDS, and its shareholders is pretty clear. There was no business between the government of Ghana and PDS, uh, TG Energy. In any event, Mr. Chairman, like I've said earlier, my understanding, and uh, I, I stand firmly on it, that directorship does not constitute interest. And so I did not have and still do not have any interest in TG Energy that would have required me to disclose in accordance with law. In any event, Mr. Chairman, TG Energy was not the entity that the government of Ghana was having the transaction with. And so, uh, in all honesty, I did not see any reason which required that I make any said di disclosures. In any event, Mr. Chairman, the documents that were submitted to Parliament with respect to the parties and their directors and shareholders in the PDS transaction were all disclosed in the documentation that was submitted to Parliament. Thank you. And when it was disclosed was TG Energy, uh, TG Energy Solution Ghana Limited, wasn't, was it not part? Yes, it was. And you are a director for TG Energy Solution Ghana Limited? Yes. Well, Mr. Chairman, let me just move on. You continue to say you disagree with the Minister of Energy on the basis they use in terminating the PDS contract. Is that right? No, Mr. Chairman, that's not what I said. I'm saying that, and the question that was asked of me was specific to my disagreement with the Minister of Energy on the use of the words fraud. Because at the time that I was making the comments, I was speaking in my capacity as a spokesperson for government communication. And the official communication that government had issued on the transaction at the time that it was suspended was that government had taken steps to suspend the PDS transaction for material breaches. I said that for the minister to have said that the transaction had been suspended because of fraud was incorrect. Subsequently, when the investigation was concluded and the government of Ghana determined that at the completion date of the transaction, there was no valid guarantee in place and proceeded to terminate it, I fully support the action that was taken by the government of Ghana to protect ECG. Thank you. Now, you said your disagreement was the use of the word fraud. Yes, Mr. Chairman. And you also said that I could, when ECG was cross-checking, said the person who, didn't, who did sign the guarantee did not have the, the authority to sign that guarantee. To the best of my knowledge, yes. So what was that? Mr. Chairman, uh, I believe that there is a legal principle. Maybe, Mr. Chairman, let me help you. Let, let him help us. What is the definition of fraud? 
fraud connotes uh, broad, uh, you know, <laughs> it depends on the circumstances really and, and, and the facts. But I'm saying that, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Chairman, the, 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 point that, the point that I'm making is this, that ordinarily, when documents come from a certain custody, and I can relate to checks, corporate checks, where you have A signatories, B signatories, C signatories, who Honorable are... Nomine, I was just asking you to define <laughs> fraud. That's all I asked you to do. Chairman, fraud. <laughs> well, maybe if you are not willing to, let me just ask him. Well, who, well, misrepresenting a fact amount to fraud. If it was in, with intent to deceive, then it would amount to fraudulent misrepresentation. Just hold it there. Did I hear you use the word fraudulent misrepresentation? <laughs> yes. Uh, is it not the same fraud word you have a problem with? Chairman. Thank you, Chairman. Mr. Chairman, no. The, so which of them the, do you have a problem the, with? The, the, the sequence of you, the... You are a trained lawyer. Yes. And uh, a contract can be vitiated on the basis of fraud and misrepresentation, and to quote you, fraudulent misrepresentation. So PDS, come clear with what the whip is uh, elucidating from you. You say you have a difficulty with the word fraud, yet you are using the word fraudulent to qualify misrepresentation. Thank you, Chair. Mr. Chairman, I want to explain. At the time that the transaction was suspended, there was absolutely no basis for the assertion that it was suspended based on fraud. And that is the point where I said I disagreed with the words that the energy minister had used. Because the communication that came from government at the time of the suspension was that there were some, some material breaches that had been detected, which was going to be investigated. It was after the investigation that the transaction was terminated. So I'm saying that at the time that the minister used those words to describe the basis for the suspension, I disagreed with him. And that's what I believe and The reason was friend, that, that he was speaking too soon. Is that it? If you like, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, here, unless maybe he wants us to go back to the tape, he said he disagreed with the minister then, and he continued to disagree with him now. For the choice of words. Yes. At the time that he used those words. Well, Mr. Chairman, let me just ask this, just on this uh, disagreement of, with the, the use of the word. Honorable Ejapa, who am I in this house? I'm just using an analogy. Who am I in this house? A member of parliament for the good people of Asawasi and the minority chief whip, leader I'm, of the house. I'm a member of this committee, right? Yes. If there's a letter to be signed by the chairman of this committee and I sign it, how will you describe that? I didn't sign for I sign. <laughs> I sign as the chair of the appointments committee. What will that be? that you have acted ultra virus your power. Would that not be misrepresentation? I believe so. If Sir. the intent is to gain, whether financially or gain influence or get some other information, would that not be fraud? Chairman, I believe so. Yes. Mr. Chairman, now that he, he, he believes so, let me move on. Are you aware that PDS is still in court with the Minister of Energy? 
the chairman, I have heard so. Yes. So you are aware they are in court? Yes. You still have your relationship intact with D TG Energy Solution Ghana Limited, right? Chairman, as of, I believe, last Friday, yes. So, Mr. Chairman, you see the difficulty that the nominee has going to the Minister of Energy as a deputy minister when a company that not directly involved but indirectly involved is litigating with the Minister of Energy? Mr. Chairman, if the committee finds it worthy to approve me. I don't see any difficulty at all. Uh, like I've said, TG Energy is not my company. And so I do not see how a rule that is only uh, by appointment can influence my decision with respect to this great republic of ours. In any event, TG Energy hasn't got any transaction with the government of Ghana. Uh, PDS has its own directors and their secretary who are best suited to take decisions for that legal entity, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, earlier he made reference to the FTI report, right? He said the issues there were very clear. Yes. Can you educate us on the clarity provided by the FTI report? Mr. Chairman, probably the conclusions that they drew, which was a request essentially for uh, pursuant to which the U.S. government requested of the government, the government of Ghana to provide TG PDS with an opportunity to procure a new guarantee. Uh, uh, just in, in brief, because it was pretty extensive it's a voluminous document that traced the commencement of the transaction, the role that the transaction advisors had played, the roles that the parties had played, and then came to a conclusion, which was that recommendation. Thank you. Mr. So Chairman, earlier too, he said that there were a lot of misconceptions, and he does not see fraud anywhere. You said this a while ago. Yes, I said so. Uh, but of course, with the chairman having drawn my attention to a potential uh, misrepresentation being fraudulent, I'm prepared to uh, change my position with respect to that aspect of my response. Chairman, thank you. Yes, majority whip. Wait, let me fill with the majority whip. Yes, I, he, he, we had missed his chance, but I said I'll give him one opportunity. If, if you're going to take it, do it. Before I come to leadership, so I'll give it to him. Uh, honorable nominee, um, <laughs> the acute response to ECG was to the effect that the officer who signed the, the guarantee did not have capacity. Correct? That is correct, Mr. Chairman. And they explained capacity to mean that he didn't have the authority to have committed the company in that transaction at the time. That is correct, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and you agree with me that by signing the letter or signing the guarantee, it amounted to he representing on behalf of our court to the to Danwell. That is correct, Mr. Chairman. All right. So basically, your disagreement is founded on that explanation from our court that it was lack of capacity on behalf by, by the person who signed. 
Mr. Chairman, indeed, this was even later in time. Uh, at the time that I disagreed with the minister was before the investigation itself had commenced. And so, yes, the response from our court, which then said that uh, lack of capacity on the part of the officer who signed being equated to fraud was what I disagreed with. Yes. All your troubles basically is because you are looking at legal technicalities and others looking at general language of communication. You know, so you are saying capacity and the minister is saying that fraud. That is the, all the, the disagreement. In other words. Mr. Chairman, I believe so. Yes. Okay. You resigned last Friday from the company as a director. Yes, I, signed, I signed my resignation and delivered it uh, for onward uh, delivery to the company's uh, uh, shareholder, yes. So as we speak, same has not been. So, Today is Monday. <laughs> you are not a director of that company. Mr. Chairman, I believe that there's some 14 days requirement in law for those notices to be filed. I would not be in a position to confirm now whether it has been filed. But I expect that at the very least, within 14 days, those notifications would have gone to the... In fact, I would ensure that that is done so that uh, my relationship is formally terminated. Thank you. You know your minister very well. I believe so. Mr. And uh, you know he's very workaholic. Are you ready to keep that pace with him? Mr. Chairman, if I'm to survive, I do not have a choice. Thank you. Very well. So, Chair, my last question. I wasn't here when you took your oath, but let me end with this very simple question to you. In all difficulties and dangers, in whom do you put your trust? Almighty God. Oh, well, I believe your faith is well founded. I wish you well. God bless you. Thank you, leader. Yes, I know, yeah, yeah. I'll give you the one before I take the last. Um, thank you very much, uh, Honorable Nominee. I see from the CV that you headed a law firm and you have several years at the bar. So my question is, is a straightforward constitutional issue, and I want to have your take on it. I recall that we have several members of parliament, seven on boards, boards of state institutions, parastatals, and agencies some even as chairpersons of those uh, boards. I have been looking at Article 98 of our Constitution. Article 98 of our Constitution. And it says in 98.2, a member of parliament shall not hold any office of profit or emolument, whether private or public, and either directly or indirectly, unless permitted to do so by the Speaker acting on the recommendations of a committee of parliament on the grounds that a holding that office will not prejudice the work of a member of parliament 
and B, no conflict of interest arises or would arise as a result of the member holding that office. On the basis of this constitutional provision, what will be the procedure for the president to appoint anybody who is a member of parliament to serve on a board or chair a board uh, of any state institution or parastata? Chairman, I believe that the words of the constitution are clear. Uh, lends itself to no interpretation at all. And that anybody who the president desires to go into another position of profit ought to obtain the permission of speaker uh, as laid out in 1982. Thank you. Is it just the speaker or that the matter has to be referred to a committee of parliament set up for that purpose and the committee has to make a recommendation to the speaker? Honorable, you came late. He has answered all those questions. He appeared before the committee, took his certificate in the last one. And no, no, no not, not, not in his capacity as the head of a firm or a private uh, company. I'm talking about members of parliament serving on boards and chairing boards of, of state institutions, the procedure for appointing them. Because very often we hear that member of parliament is on this board, that board, an announcement is effected. It doesn't come to parliament for approval. It doesn't go to the speaker for its approval. And yet... We, we don't know that for a fact, since those are personal. The applications are personal. So let's leave that to... It, it's not a general thing. So let's leave that. If, the, if he had one, if he was a chair, and we have evidence that he hasn't applied, let's deal that to him. But otherwise... No, this is a general constitutional question. What is the proper process? Oh, why? When honorable member, yes, when a member yes. is appointed yes. a chair or a member of a committee, what is the procedure for obtaining a board, a state, is it a, a corporate or even a private member? Um, even though even a private one is still business of profit, what is the procedure for obtaining um, the, the certificate to uh, practice in that direction for profit? Speaker, um, li like I said, I mean, the procedure is spelled out uh, like my senior colleague himself read out that you need to appear before the committee that is set up by parliament, uh, which in this case is a committee for members holding office of profit. And uh, their recommendation goes to the speaker for approval. Uh, and so that process ought to be carried through, uh, uh, I believe. Thank you. Yes, honorable minority leader, you may now ask a question. German, uh, I should thank the I should thank you once again for the opportunity. But just to paraphrase a non succinct ruling of the court uh, that it is axiomatic that fraud cannot be predicated on truth. Fraud cannot be predicated on truth. Therefore, if a representation is untrue, it is fraudulent. And if a representation is false, it will amount to contractual law, a fraudulent misrepresentation, which becomes the basis of the government of Ghana wanting to vitiate the contract with PDS. So question of semantics, you can choose to have problems with the word fraud, but it is the case. So by your understanding, why was the contract with PDS vitiated by government? Mr. Chairman, I think that I agreed with uh, uh, Chairman's uh, elucidation of uh, misrepresentation and the fact that misrepresentations could be fraudulent. And uh, so to that extent, uh, yes, without sound, sounding repetitive, uh, at, the, at the time that I disagreed with the minister, 
uh, I felt it was too early because no facts had been established at that point. But subsequently, when uh, it turned out that uh, the investigation had led to a certain outcome, the uh, government of Ghana was right in its uh, uh, wisdom to terminate the agreement. So just keep it there. What was government's wisdom? There is no contra. What is the wisdom? Share with us. What is government's wisdom? In terminating the contract, what is the wisdom? If you disagree with the whip that it is not on the basis of false representation. Mr. Chairman, the wisdom was that obviously if the issuing party which had provided guarantees to, as it were, restore government of Ghana in the event of some wrong being occasioned by PDS. So you can hold your view, but the truth remains that there was misrepresentation by one of the parties. That's why the matter is in court. I'm Mr. not Chairman, saying that. I, I agree, I don't agree be, with you. I'm not saying that don't be Chairman, entitled I agree, I agree to with that you. view. I agree with you. And then, Chairman, this now brings me to I'm holding a copy. Fair, fair to you. You don't have a copy. PIAC report, Public Interest and Accountability Committee, established under the Petroleum Revenue Management Act, Act 815, annual report for 2018. And probably I've seen in your CV negotiations, you are involved in oil and gas. I don't know what your emphasis will be at that ministry. But hear these words of, the, of PIAC. The carried and participating interest, copy, followed by royalties, constitutes significant source of revenue to the state. In this regard, in negotiations, in respect of petroleum agreements, it is important that the government negotiate tenaciously in respect of these two. What assurance do you give to this committee that you safeguard the interests of the state? Should you have some responsibility relating to this matter? Thank you, Chair. Chairman, I believe that it will be my abiding duty that in all my activities, I work to safeguard the interests of Ghana. And so you can have my word that that would exactly be what I will do. Thank you. Chairman, back to PDS. Are you suggesting to this committee that somebody failed to undertake proper due diligence to safeguard the interests of the state? Mr. Chairman, I believe that the transaction advisors, particularly in view of the principle that official deeds are deemed to have been regularly performed, uh, guarantee that bears the corporate signage seal signature of an official of our court will be deemed by anybody who is doing due diligence to have come from proper custody. And so to that extent, I do not know whether it will be appropriate to say somebody failed to do proper due diligence. Could the circumstances that led to the termination have been avoided by officials of government? Thank you, Chair. Mr. Chairman, I believe that the timing of the transaction itself was what led to the request to do post-transaction further due diligence. And so that in itself suggests some clear good faith actions by official them to safeguard the asset. And it was this post-transaction due diligence that uh, revealed the lack of capacity or if you like the misrepresentation by the official of our court in the execution. All right, thank you, Charles. So do you see in that misrepresentation forgery on the part of any person? 
Mr. Chairman, I wouldn't be in a position to say, but I can understand that some individuals who are working in an official capacity can act in excess of their authority. Ultra-virus, as you said. Uh, absolutely, and, 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 and it may be difficult for you, a third party. And I understand that the matter is in court, but for us, safeguarding the interests of the state, the accounts of PDS, as I understand, have not been reconciled. The government of Ghana, ECG, have no access to it. It was escrowed in the name of PDS. There is a matter in court. The people of Ghana want to know what happens to the money sitting in that account. You want to share your view on that with us? If you go there to assist the minister, what advice are you likely to give him? Because that is state money. Mr. Chairman, escrow would necessarily have some escrow agreement that would contain the instructions pursuant to which releases can be made out of that escrow account. So far, I haven't heard in all of this that PDS has actually assessed the funds, which then suggests to me that they do not have direct control in how the escrow is managed. That then will suggest to me that potentially the government of Ghana or ECG would have a role in how the escrow account is expended. All right, so and leave it there, Chairman. So there are major unresolved issues bordering on the PDS uh, transaction. The country have lost a good and fair opportunity to have allowed... Honorable, I think you're concluding from his statement. Please, ask for that question. This is your conclusion. is all part of the record, please. Uh, when you Chairman, finish, which record? What you're counting now. You're building I'm not up on an anything. answer to his question. No, which I no, think I'm making an so observation just follow that... Follow up with your question. Please. Chairman, I'm making an observation that there are unresolved matters with PDS, and I stand by a Chairman. I'm not challenging your right to say that, but I'm saying don't fix it on his answer. I don't fix it to him. I That's what you're statement. trying to no, no. But please ask your next question. No, no, you got it wrong, Chairman. I just said, ah, has the account been reconciled to the best of your knowledge? I'm speaking on authority. The account have not been reconciled. Nobody in Ghana knows how much was paid into PDS account. Nobody in Ghana knows what is happening to that account. That's a comment I made. Anyway, back to PIAC, another observation. It is observed that in 2018, GNCC earned as much as 85.2 million US dollars. GNCC, to pay its debt to GMPC for that year. However, it chose to apply the entire amount to its operations. We are going to the Minister of Energy. You'll be assisting the Minister for Energy. Uh, GNCC makes money. Instead of uh, clearing its outstanding obligations, it chooses to spend on its operations. What are you likely to do about it should you be approved as Deputy Minister? Thank you, Chair. Mr. Chairman, I believe that um, when my minister appeared before the committee, uh, these are all issues that relate to the transparency in the management of our oil revenues that the minister uh, dealt with in his responses and said that he would ensure that we have some more transparency in the management of our resources. And I can assure you that I would assist him in ensuring that measures are put in place that then uh, provides the requisite transparency uh, to avert these issues from occurring. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Again, allocations from ABFA, and I take it again from the PIAC report and observation some of the money remaining unspent, yet there are competing interests of state and competing demands across the country, yet you have this significant amount of money, I can refer to it, which for a particular year is not spent. 
The petrol revenue management act, even though shepherded by the Ministry of Finance, the ministry you are going to will have a role. What do you promise to do about this? Thank you, Chair. Mr. Chairman, I believe that there's a provision in the uh, Petroleum Revenue Management Act that when funds that were allocated to the ABFA are on, on spent, they ought to be transferred to either the Heritage Fund or the Stabilization Fund. And so if those provisions are not being adhered to, then that clearly ought to be uh, 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 done away with. And so um, I will take a look at it and then uh, proffer my advice on, on what to do to my minister for him to liaise with the Ministry of Finance to uh, ensure that the right things are done. Thank you. Very well, Honorable. We thank you for attending upon the committee to answer questions. You will hear from us later, but for now, you are discharged. Thank you. I'm very grateful to this committee, Mr. Chairman. Thank you so much.